You're listening to Pop, the History Makers, with me, Steve Blame. Welcome. This is a great pleasure, and I know that you wrote to me on Instagram, and we've connected over there, and now we're here and doing this interview. Now you're a cultural icon. You're a, you've been a star on stage, screen. You've had a record, which is also a hit, particularly uh, in, in Australia and New Zealand uh, in the 80s, which I remember. And um, you've lived an experience which is different, unusual, and I guess at times difficult and wonderful. So I'd really like to talk to you about your whole life and come to all those cultural aspects and, and what has happened in your life. But I'm going to begin in the fishing port of Grimsby, right. uh, which is, a. Uh, um, I don't know, how do you look back on those early days of your life? Was that a, was that a difficult period? Well, I don't often look back on them. I always look you know, because I don't often look back with Steve because, you know, obviously that's not the way I'm going. But um, in situations like this, um, Grimsby, well, I think Grimsby, uh, the name says it all, doesn't it? Grimsby, you know. So um, I suppose when the, uh, you know, the light bulb came on, I had to... Uh, Followed the yellow brick road to, you know, bigger pastures, as they say. So um, I I um, left Grimsby, um, I think I was 17, uh, 18, because I was in a kid's home um, from the ages of 13 to 17, nearly 18. And um, Grims, Grimsby, you know, in those days, I mean, the, the thing is, you know, you get like um, uh, LGBT, young LGBT people these days who obviously have all their own trials and tribulations. But I mean, the thing is, they, you know, they, they would have no concept of what uh, the Moors of the times were like when I was a uh, a child, a teen, you know, with multiple marginalizations, the color of my skin, my idiosyncratic behaviors, the sound of my voice, um, was always constantly under attack of ridicule and uh, defamation and, uh, um, you know, uh, physical and ver verbal violence, you know, sometimes. So, um, you know, the, the 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 only thing to do was really to get out of this small town and just find somewhere um, a bit more um, liberal minded and, uh, you know, tolerant, really a bit more cosmopolitan. Um, I think, you know, looking back on things and the connections that I had and the, you know, friendships that I had there, and they weren't many. Um, I, you know, and, and the behaviours that I, uh, atrocious, abysmal uh, treatment that I uh, had, um, I, I think that, um, you know, it was be, being a, an oversensitive child, if you like, kid, um, it was a lot to do with my, my own perceptions as well when I think of certain people who were actually you know, wanting to help me and wanting to, who were encouraging me to move, you know, as well, if that makes any sort of sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, I mean, obviously my story is different, but when I was young and particularly a teenager, when I was sort of discovering my sexuality as a gay man, I, I would find a pop star like David Bowie, who I identified with because I wanted to leave my world of my parents and you know where I felt marginalized as well and go into another world where I felt I could be happy was there anyone um for you that you didn't necessarily know as a pop star or whatever um who you looked up to and thought I want to be in that world oh yeah loads I mean the thing is it, it you know the, the, there was loads of people that gave me uh, a rescue from normality and banality and abnormality of what you know what was sold to me or purported to be you know normal behavior um of 
you know, the, the heterosexual dominant normative. Um, and um, if anything, you know, was to deter you from the heterosexual dominant normative was the heterosexual dominant normatives. But um, yes, there was loads of deranged people. I mean, you know, there was people like, oh, Mae West, you know, who, who for a long time, I used to think what was actually a drag queen, you know, from the 30s, because I, I had um, one of my first landlords in Grimsby Town was somebody called Jimmy Slater, who was a drag queen. Um, in the 20s, 30s and 40s. And my mother used to say, oh, well, we all used to go down and see him um, on Cleethorpe's Beach, the, the Jimmy Slater Follies. And um, so, you know, he was very reminiscent of uh, Mae West, you know, and he was a friend of all these big old legendary uh, musical people like Sophie Tucker and uh, Florrie Ford and friends of Mae West, you know, actually gave him some of their costumes um, because he used to, in his, he, he was like in his late 80s and 90s when I, he was my landlord. And um, so, you know, to continue his uh, showing off career, um, he used to have a um, fancy dress hire company which used to come from his garage up in Cleethorpes. So, um, but you know, the, the people like me, West, people like her, the kid, good times and bum times. I've seen them all and my dear, I'm still here. So there was her and there was like Cleo Lane, you know, Fridays, not the most of Fridays. And there was, um, who else was there? Uh, uh, Lena Horn, I want to sing something different. You know, and so there was all these amazing people. And then there were people like Janice Joplin and, uh, oh, um, just Frank Zappa, you know, people like that that gave me a rescue. And of course, I loved all the uh, going to school, you know, with the, um, as a, you know, uh, primary, uh, infant school kid i used to love going to school school with the sound of the uh the mersey beach you know freddie and the dreamers Scylla black and you know the beatles um and 70s my great inspirations there was 70s music you know um sylvester mighty real who actually became a friend a bit of a friend in the um 80s, you know, when I had a hit, uh, pissed in my pocket. And um, so there were a lot of um, influences, you know, and uh, which led me to other things, you know, which led me to people like Miriam McCabe and, uh, um, you know. What, what do you think being marginalised, um, and this sounds a strange question in a way, but I think sometimes you can derive strength from being pushed out, being an outsider. What do you think it may have given you in a positive term because you had to adapt, because you had to um, fight it, you know, you had to be yourself to fight it. What do you think it gave you in, in your life in that way? Well, I think that, um, you know, when you're... Um, and it kind of makes you an innate loner as opposed to somebody that feels lonely. You know, there's a distinct difference there. And I'm an innate loner. I don't actually need to have people around me all the time to tell me that I exist and how special I am. You know, I've done a lot of uh, inner work. I always say it's always an inside job. So I think being an innate loner, what, what it did was made me uh, discover inner strengths um, that I never knew I had before. You know, when you, when you have to bear the brunt of everything on your own for so long in your life, you, you do find these strengths that can't come from anywhere else other than from uh, within. So um, it just kind of makes you very, uh, makes you a very staunch individual, I think, in the end. And um, I often feel very sorry um, taking the judgment out of it for people that actually can't stand their own company, that actually can't stand being on their own. I've never had a partner to um, give me a break from myself or put the responsibility of who I am onto them. 
Um, and um, so um, I just think staunch individual, individual, on individual individualism, and um, an an ability to um, analyze things a bit more because you're always asking why. You know, not so much. You know, it's like people. It's not so much what they're doing, but why they do it. It's not so much what you did, but why. You did it. Why are you doing it? Why is this happening? You know, what is the uh, psychology behind the behaviour, good or bad? You know, so is it, has it all also sort of given you your drive in life to be successful and continue and to continually be creative? Has it given you that? Oh, absolutely. Even you know, even though you know, um, your attempts at moving, moving forward uh, have been thwarted a lot of the time, you know, because I, ca I come through, you, you know, as I say, uh, the mores of certain times where it's like, um, you know, your only experience would, would be um, exclusion because you're not an archetype. You don't come with the correct social currency. You don't come with the correct cultural uh, um, uh, uh, currency. So, um, you know, you, you, you have to deal with a lot of, um, I think, added uh, rejection and doors being slammed in your face and ostracism, flack, ridicule. But, you know, you, you have to stay on the, the treadmill. You know, I always say, uh, you know, give in, give out, but don't give up. You just you know, mentioned that, that, sorry. That, sorry, that's always sort of, that's been my motto for quite a long time, really. Now, you mentioned that at 17 or 18 that you 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 left um, and you went to Manchester. Yeah. Was um, was Manchester, this, sound, this also sounds a bit weird to say this, but was Manchester sort of some promised land or was there pockets within Manchester that you could find and exist in a way that you wanted to exist well the thing is uh steve i was free you know i was out of the kids home um and i was free you know so um i found a bed sit through the help of an organization at the time called shea um campaign for homosexual equality um so um i don't ever think that i felt uh you know, uh, homos homosexual, but I suppose, you know, because there was always this great misalignment between my mind and my body, you know, which was always sort of like female chemistry going on in the neuroplasticity, uh, which created this misalignment with the body. But, you know, at the time, um, for all intents and purposes, and, you know, for, for, for reality check, um, I was a young, uh, non-white uh, gay boy, you know. So, um, you know, there's still a bit of that in me. Um, well, there was the other night. And, um, but, um, but the thing is, well, this way to the grotto, I know Christmas is over. Um, but, um, oh, there's always a star on the top of my tree, Steve. And, um, but... Um, uh, yes, so, so, but, you know, at least like there, you know, there were some brilliant people that had set up this um, organisation that could help you and mentor you a bit. So, um, yes, so um, Manchester was the big metro uh, metropolitan uh, city for me. And it was, um, you know, uh, certainly... Um, and I, an adventure that I look forward to. And of course, when I got into Manchester and started meeting people and going to clubs and things, you know, I met, um, you know, uh, a, a drag queen there, Bunny Lewis, very famous uh, drag queen, and uh, received the Royal Variety Club of Great Britain Award from Danny LaRue um, in 76, 77, I think it was. And he became my agent. And I started uh, drag disco DJing and performing, um, you know, around all the, 
the big working men's social clubs then. I mean, there, there was quite um, a proliferation and, uh, you know, uh, what should I say, wide circuit where you could work working men's clubs uh, three, four nights a week and, you know, pay your rent and keep a roof over your head and everything. And I shortly became known as the Shirley Bassey of the North. I mean, I'm not a massive Shirley Bassey fan, but you know, I used to, I will love you as I love you all. You know, so I used to, uh, I became known as the Shirley Bassey of the North and um, I ended up working uh, from the rough, brutal working men's clubs to like their, their posh versions of the London talk of the town, like the Golden Garter, Fagin's, the Long Bar, the talk of the North, you know, and I'd be, find myself on the same bill, you know, like as the Nolan, you know, or as the Three Degrees were on there. Incidentally, Sheila of the Three, three, three Degrees um, did the additional uh, vocals on Pistol in My Pocket um, in the, in the, uh, eight bar where she says, oh, is that a pistol in your pocket? A, a pistol in your pocket. That's not actually me on the original. That's Sheila Ferguson of the three degrees. So Sheila, when will I see you again? <laughs> oh, I'll come to that a bit later. Just uh, talking about the working men clubs, the ones, I mean, they were, uh, the ones that you mentioned at first, they were notoriously tough. Um, and, you know, if you hear interviews with, uh, comedians or other performers, they would always talk about how tough they were. Yeah. How tough were they with you uh, because of your identity, because of who you were, as opposed to you as a performer? Well, um, it was more, um, well, it depended very much where you were booked in. I think I was booked into some quite dodgy and dangerous places. Um, but I'd always had an iron fist behind the limp wrist, you know, when you come from Grimsby, you know, um, you have to know how to look after yourself. Um, and my dad was a boxer and I do a bit of boxing. Um, but not that you pride yourself on uh, being violent. You must, But I think that you must always be prepared to come to your own physical self-defence. But, you know, the thing is, I always, I was always a black belt in now put it like that so if somebody started you know it was like a machine gun that went off and of course that absolutely nullified the rest of the crowd but you know people people like Shirley Bass you know the kids so I got respect for from that but um I worked Bernard Manning's club for him uh one Sunday night I always remember I wanted the Shirley of the North now he he was as polite as anything me in the dressing room but his language and attitude soon changed when he introduced me i've got this in a frock he said you know and actually use that word you know um thinks it's fucking hell if that's it you know and so i thought oh god you know i've got to go on and enter uh, thank you for warming them up for me Bernie. and i went on um the crowd was uh, appreciate, you know, appreciative, um, luckily. But, you know, as Dame Shirley Bass, I said, well, I have to thank uh, Bernard for inviting me uh, to the stage this evening. I mean, you know, uh, when they want to clean the Mersey Tunnel out, they pull that fat bastard through. And he doesn't have elastic in his knickers anymore. It's fucking swish rail. Now, let me sing another song, you know, so... I, I just gave back as much as I got, really, you know. I always felt that um, uh, performers, drag performers, who stand up against, uh, up to a crowd and and have to do this very, you know, tough performance of you've done, were at the forefront of LGBTQ rights because there you are in a, in a working man's club, in a very heterosexual working class environment, mm -hmm. And this is probably their own, their only connection of, to someone from the LGBTQ community. So in a way, I've always felt that that role was one of the sort of fundamental roles in change. How, 
How much do you see, see that as an important role in your life? Well, yes. I mean, the thing is, I think it was my type, my kind, if you like, um, the the non the gender nonconformists, um, those who considered themselves to be men in frocks, you know, drag queens, um, that um, had to tread where angels feared to tread, really. Um, but you know, I mean, the thing is, it was all about uh, doing your craft, and um, you know, it, it, it that educated and enlightened people that was uh, an added bonus you know but um, I soon discovered though you know even at an early age that um, you know it wasn't just those of us that they accuse of being the dupes of our own existence that were the dupes of their own existence I mean we were in good company with the cis heterodominant normative or usuality so I discovered that a long time that you know uh, straight men like tranny fanny, you know, <laughs> and um, so there was a, a a lot of the the onion was being peeled and the curtain pulled back on a lot of things, you know, which probably would account for my jadedness at this stage in life. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, tell me about this jadedness because I always feel like you know people of our generation fought. Uh, for rights during a period when it was very difficult. Do you know what I mean? People always talk about the 80s as being this sort of wonderful music era, which it was, but it was, you know, it was homophobia, um, homophobia there was sexism, racism, misogyny, there was everything during that period as well. And the 70s, you were almost a serial killer to be different. Okay. Do you know what I mean? It was even worse. So, and we had to go through that period and today it's much easier, but there seems to be a lack of respect for um, the people that went before and had to open things up. Do you feel that? Well, let's face it, it was our generation and generations before us that for, for all these kings and queens to wear their crowns with pride today. And I often feel, you know, I don't want to get into being an old, uh, resentful tranma. But, um, you know, I often feel like um, we're dealing with a bunch of spoiled brat teenagers on many levels who are taking a lot of our fight for their gains for granted, you know. And um, that makes me incredibly resentful in moments of uh, pensiveness. Um, you know, to think, I, I think sometimes, God, I wish I hadn't have gone out there for them. You know, I really do feel like that. And then I'm inspired by meeting young people who know exactly who I am, who know, who have seen, you know, the doc documentary uh, Beyond, There's Always a Black Issue, Dear. There's another documentary coming out called The Legendary People, which I'm featured in, a new documentary that has been made by uh, Rob Faulkner, a uh, film and docu documentary maker. And um, so that should be, you know, coming to all kinds of screens and festivals soon. Um, but I do, you know, I, I am inspired and uplifted when, you know, you get a, a younger, uh, millennial or gen z generation you know coming up no, knowing exactly what your um if you like legacy uh as it is and you know they're fighting you know they're fighting this rotten government um they're fighting for the rights you know and they have the right level of insight and empathy you know so that's quite so yeah. it was in Manchester that you met Marky Smith. Yeah. Can you tell me about that meeting and what it led to? Well, I was working in a French shop. It was called the, the Black Market, just to be controversial and, you know, to keep the customers coming in. And it was in Levenshume, Manchester, on Levenshume uh, Road there. And um, it was one of the first sort of antique-type clothes shops 
and you know antique bric-a-brac and sold a bit of furniture and stuff that um became a cafe as well now it's a it's a proper restaurant in Leverzume. i think it's still there but anyway i was work, working there at the age of 18 and um this um guy came in called steve and he had a band called the odd and uh they were very sort of avant-garde punky uh improvisational and they wanted a vocalist um uh, you know who could make up words and um you know to sort of front some of their their gigs you know well i did my first gig with with them at uh, the uh, Russell Club in Moss Side, which was a reggae club, you know, it's full of rasters um, uh, in uh, Moss Side. So, um, and uh, they were actually supporting the fall. So I met Marky e. Smith at 18, he was 19, um, and Kay Carroll, his girlfriend and manager at the time. And uh, we, we all just became really, really good friends um, because I don't think they, you know, had a friend like me uh, with my idiosyncratics and all that before. And they thought that I'd done a really good performance. And Mark was saying, oh, you should come and, you know, should come and uh, uh, introduce the phone, you know, love. Uh, all right, car. And um, so... I started introducing the, you know, the fall and at gigs, uh, university gigs and what, polytechnic gigs. And uh, then I got roped into doing stuff in some of their videos and um, speaking words and what have you, uh, you know. I mean, I could never make out what Mark's words were, you know. I mean, his, his writing to me was very individual, very individualistic in its obtuseness, really. Um, but um, anyway, I enjoyed it because it was all show business and spotlights. So I, I enjoyed it. But weren't you actually also in a band that supported? Oh, yes. That, that time? I, got, I got a band together in the end called uh, the Ice Cream Pleasures as opposed to Ice Cream. So it was Ice Cream Pleasures. And um, I supported The Fall and did various gigs with that. And actually, that's really what I'm going to go back to um, artistically, art-wise. So tell me about the the music that you would perform and about the performance then of, of this band. Oh, of the Ice Cream Pleasures. Well, I used to I, I write, used to write songs and they were recorded by On You Sound System with uh, uh, Adrian Sherwood later on but I used to have a song called I refuse to be a classic queen don't want no obscure scene so you liars can go dream about how clean I am you machines with rusty gears you've been conditioned with lies and fears you live your lives in a lucky bag you rag bags I never give you a chance to be my fag, hags, you rag, hags. You know, so that was probably the only <laughs> Very endearing, isn't it? <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, there was a song called uh, Spirit Souls. You know, we're not these bodies, we're spirit souls, never dying, always flying, spirit souls, which is what I believe we are. And uh, another one, which is about this uh, day and age. So I was a bit of a, um, a Nostradamus. Um, and it, that was called Demonic Horses in the Air. Demonic Horses Everywhere. Demonic. So, you know, that's about, uh, that was about how uh, we're ruled by, you know, uh, despot governments. <laughs> Were you yeah. coming down to London at that time as well? Were you actually going, you know, coming, I mean, I presume yeah. you hadn't moved down to London by then, but you were coming down to London and visiting and getting to know people there. Yeah, I mean, I, I did um, a, a gig, you know, I did gigs at the old Dingwalls Music 
uh, place in Camden. I did uh, gigs at the um, oh, what do, what was the club? The famous club on Wardour Street. Um, uh, hundred club, the hundred club. No, that's no, that, that's Ox, Oxford Street. Right. But, Famous club on, on Ward, or okay. I'll remember in a minute. And, um, you know, uh, Richard Ransom's venue in Victoria. And um, so I did, you know, places like that. And then um, my friend Richard, uh, um, Jimmy Gardner, who is the husband of um, Neil Bartlett, who's, who's got a play on at the moment in the West End, um, he had a boyfriend called uh, Jimmy. Had a boyfriend called uh, Trevor, who was a Harry Krish ex Harry Krishna devotee, which of course I got into a bit with my old mate Polystyrene uh, when I moved down to London to to the squad. So they brought me down to London. They were very reluctant to leave me at this squad in Clapton Pond, um, which was a rundown council block, um, but it was surrounded by uh, the National Front. And the National Front one night uh, decided to run us out of um, our squad, our home, uh, with Molikov cocktails. So uh, I rushed to another squad in Power Square uh, during the Notting Hill Gate riot of uh, 81 into what was apparently Graham Greene, the novelist's uh, old house um, and stayed there for, you know, maybe a year and a half and that's when I met, um, you know, Polly uh, Styrene. I mean, I was searching for, I've always been uh, on a search for deeper identity, you know, I think it's a good thing, which brought me to Krishna consciousness at the time and uh, connected me with one of my good friends at the time, Polly Styre, who uh, became, uh, what was her name, Maria Grishny or whatever her, uh, uh, Harry Christian name was. Um, anyway, she stayed. So there's me living in this squad amongst the riot and Polly uh, living in this really nice <laughs> riverside uh, loft, you know, uh, a apartment on the in Rotherhide um so uh but Polly stayed with the Krishna consciousness I mean you know she'd found her bliss in that whereas I just for me it was just a revelation oh well religion is just an old boys club in it and I don't want to be surrounded by barra boys in doherty's pretending that they've got a hotline to sky god you know so, so I uh, she stayed and I went to Las Vegas. <laughs> so when did you meet Lee, Lee Bowery then? Because uh, Lee Bowery was in London from about 81, I think, something like that, 81, 82. That's right. And I was probably one of the first people that would later on become a friend of his. Um, one of the first people he'd ever met in London. And so... Um, so I went to see this friend of mine, Trevor, who was the boyfriend of Jimmy Gardner, who brought me down to London to the squad. And um, anyway, so um, Trevor uh, was this ex Harry Krishna devotee. He was uh, turned into a bit of a slag, really, because he was, you know, forever at it. And um, so, uh, and I thought I'd flatten some grass in my time. But um, anyway, so. Um, I went and had lunch with him one day and I, when we'd finished lunch um, I was left, came down the stairs and there was this big um, what I could only describe as like a big sort of hairdresser type, you know, I know that's very, <laughs> very stereotyping but it was like bleach blonde hair I was said that much bleach on his head, it's pickled his brain. But uh, bleach blonde hair with these puffy, black puffy sleeves, sort of lousy thing on, and these nice fitting slacks, these lovely blue eyes, this round face, and it looked quite sort of a lot, you know, had a fair amount of adipose tissue on the body. But anyway, he was there with these cases and what seemed like a hundred 
black bin liner bags taking it up to this room, you know, this bedsit room. So he'd obviously just arrived from, in, from Australia. So I said, oh, do you need any help, love? And he said, oh, yes, please, you know, in this Australian voice. And then that was my first encounter with Lee Barry, not knowing what the future connection or the future form of Lee Bowery would be, you know, <laughs> would become. So how did it come to that he would um, design clothes for you? How did that relationship develop and how did it come to that point? Uh, well, yeah, well, you know, I became somewhat of a muse for him later on, but um, I um, started in the comic strip. Uh, the comic strip came about when uh, uh, Keith Allen, Lily, Alan's dad. I used to hold Lily Allen as a baby. Um, I was on the swings in Powys Square uh, one afternoon and Keith Allen came over. I had no notion who Keith Allen was. He was living next door but one to me in a flat. I was in a squad. He was in a flat uh, sharing with this other, with this uh, Ian, I think, this other guy. And um, anyway, he came over, sat on the swings next to me and the picture is, I've got shaved hair, it is bleached blonde, it has a pink triangle on one side and a blue triangle on the other side, and it was trim, framed in a green, you know. I had a Dusty Springfield type pink sequin 60s top on, a uh, luminous green uh, lycra uh, slacks, and Sylvester jellyfish sandals on, and I'm on the swings there. So he came, comes over, obviously very inquisitive, starts chatting to me, says he's is, um, got his own show coming on the new Channel 4, would I like to be in it? So yes, please. Um, anyway, so um, basically that's how it came about. And it's through that we did these embryonic episodes of something called uh, The Bullshit as subtitled Roll Out the Barrel. Um, so I did a couple of those on Channel 4. I'd met Peter Richardson of the uh, Comic Strip Presents. He, he was the producer and the writer of the group. And he said, oh, I'd like you to... Be... I was in a bed sit by this time in Primrose Hill. £6.50 a week. And... Um, they, uh, so he said, um, uh, would I like to be in the comics strip, you know, and I could help write my own lines and scenarios. And that's how that came about. So Peter became a bit of a Svengali. So it was through that that Lee started noticing me because I was like the only sort of unapologetic outre type on the screen, it seemed at that time. I mean, you, you know, you had like your white camp people like John Inman and your Danny LaRue's and your Larry Grayson's, but I was like a new sort of breed, you know, camp with a brown face, you know. And um, so everybody was zooming in on me, but, you know, Lee got in touch and said, oh, I'd like to make me some clothes. And, you know, so, yeah, so I went over to, to his tower, Hamlet's flat with his famous um, Star Trek wallpaper on. And we just became friends. And, you know, it was like every Sunday I'd end up there in the afternoon and Lee and I would just talk. He was very edifying. And we just had loads of cheese and cress sandwiches on Hovis and pots and pots of Earl Grey tea. And he'd teach me a bit of piano and measure me for this outfit. And I actually have... Um, Lee Bowery originals that nobody's known that he's made me, but um, they are going to be going on um, into an exhibition. And I think the exhibition goes on tour. Um, it, it, it's uh, organized by Martin Green of Soho Radio. And um, so one of the costumes that Lee made for me will be lent to go into the uh, exhibition. I mean, he was a fascinating um, character because he was. I always thought he was, I mean, he was a very intelligent person. Um, he was creatively, you know, uh, very skilled. Um, but he had this 
he had this wit and he had he used to he used to love sort of slagging people off a little bit which was always very entertaining with Lee because you always knew you'd be the butt of a joke somewhere as well do you know what I mean so oh, it was, yeah it was a hunt and um, to pronounce it so, you know I mean he was a right little shit stirrer when he you know <laughs> wanted to be and um you know and he used to try and coercively control Never with me, because he knows that he'd get a knuckle butty. But um, he was, um, no, you know, he he, he, he did use to, to stare it. And also, you know, if you left your handbag in the room, it'd pilfer through it, see what you'd got in there. And, um, you know, and um, and I, I always used to get him back. I mean, I never, ever sent him a Christmas card or a birthday card. It was always a get well soon card <laughs> and also uh, because of this pilfering what I do at times is take an item of his behind his back and on his birthday I would wrap it up and give it to him you know so he knew so I'd give him his own prop so if it was a pair of socks out of his drawer I'd wrap them up nicely on his birthday or Christmas and go there's a little present for you thank you for being a friend and you'd be like but these are my <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a brilliant thing to do. But, How did... but no, Sorry. he he was very edifying, very very well read, um, to the point where he sort of could pontificate and you know be a bit sort of arrogant about it. You just have to tell him to, you know, put a sock in his tyranny of thought. You know, so so tell me about pistol in my pocket. How did how did that come about? Uh, well, um, I met um, Pete Burns, who became a friend. Uh, well, you was always more of a friend to Pete than he was for you because Pete was only available when he won, you know, he made himself available, or to put it very bluntly, when he wanted something. Um, but he was, Pete was an incredibly generous, generous spirit. You know, he would give the, the shirt off his own back, you know, if he could help somebody in that moment. Um, and, uh, you know, a mentalist. Um, he had a great capacity for retention of information or anything he'd read, where it's like my mind is just, you know, a fleshy sieve, you know, it just... Although I do remember life. So when I'm doing a play, I remember my lines and almost everybody else's, you know, so that's uh, a consolation. But um, I met Pete with Jane County. Jane County came to stay with me in uh, 83, 84. And um, I was living in a studio flat on Hampstead Road. So there wasn't very much room. But Jane would have been another one uh, homeless had I not been able to provide something for us so she stayed oh it, well, well it's not only gonna be a week um it stayed it was like about five weeks in the end <laughs> and um but you know she was a great guest uh jane and um, we were just in soho one day she said oh pete's uh recording in um studio in soho i forget what the name is and um Anyway, so we went, um, I was introduced to Pete and Lynn and Steve Coy. And, um, you know, Pete said, oh, you, you'd, be, you'd be good as a singer. You know, so I said, yeah, well, I do do a bit of that. And um, what happened? I just sort of got inspired. I thought, I don't, you know, I'm not Pete Burns, you know, for a start, I'm, you know, more alive than dead. And um, also, you know, it's like all the impersonations I, as I did, I never wanted to be these people, but I wanted to be somebody like them, you know, stand on my own star celebrity stage, if you like. So, um, you anyway, know, I just thought, oh, I'm just going to ring Pete Waterman. I'll ring the Vineyard Studios. They'll know me from the comic strip. I want to hit, you know, not, I want a record, but I want a hit. So he said, oh, yeah, come come round, uh, Alana. We'll, we'll, you know, have a chat about it. So I went 
and met Pete Waterman. And it was quite a funny encounter. And um, he said, have you got any ideas? I said, oh yeah, I've written this song, Pete. Um, should I sing it to you a cappella? Yeah, go on then. So I sang this song. Um, surrender your gender. Agenda. Agenda. Surrender your gender. Agenda. Agenda. Well, Pete sort of like, literally like this. And then just cracked up, pissed himself laughing and fell on the floor almost like this, laughing. And I just sat there, I thought, how rude. You know, so he said, well, to be honest with you, Lana, I don't think that's going to get Radio Radio 1 airplay. So let's give it a week and we'll come up with something. So he got Morrison and Washbourne to write the song Pistol in My Pocket. And probably about two weeks from our meeting, I went and recorded it in sections uh, in the studio and that's how that transpired you know um and then they wrote um i can make a man out of you as a follow-up um uh, which i wasn't too really keen on because there was a really good song there called something about um love all over the world you know i thought no i need to be you know the new um what, what's the Brotherhood of Man, um, the the New Seekers. I needed to be, you know, Lynn from the New Seekers. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, so I was forced to. I can make a, you know, record. I can make a man out of you. And of course, you know, it wasn't the best um, follow up, really. Yeah, and I was very fractious in those days with people. You know, I felt like I was. You know, my head was in a vice, you know, um, society uh, wasn't accepting, you know, you everywhere I went, um, you know, you were being pointed at and, you know. Met, how, how come Pistol in My Pocket became a hit in Australia, though? That's that's something that, because it, you know, became very big in Australia. Um, so well, how, how did that come about? Well, how, how it came about was... Um, uh, it, it mushroom liberation records in Australia. Um, uh, John, uh, what's his name? John Jonathan Coleman. Do you remember Jonathan Coleman had a, a big radio show there, and he liked it and started promoting it. So really, it was down to Jonathan's um, liking of it um, that um, you know. Made and Molly it. Meldrum, I presume, because Molly yeah, was, I mean, exactly. I knew Molly, and Molly was a really big figure in Australia yeah, in terms of and, music. And it came to Molly's attention, and of course, um, you know, started entering the charts, and I think it went to, it went top ten in Australia. So did you go to Australia to promote it? No, I didn't. I mean, the, the um, I mean, it kept, became very big, but messages that I got from there, you know, and I don't have a woe is me. I don't have a, 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 an ounce of self-pity in my body, you know, because I've thrown as much, flung as mu much mud back. Um, but, um, you know, there, there was like, it was like when Eat the Rich came out, there was death threats, um, but the police told me to stop sending those. Uh, but um, there was, um, the, you know, uh, there were death threats, there was, you know, racist sort of hate uh, males, you know, and um, and it was the same like in Australia, really. So I was dissuaded really not to go. You know, I just thought, well, don't go anywhere if you're not welcome, you know, and it, it's such a shame because of, um, you know, the fan, fans. So I suppose it was a case of, you know, being defeated by the haters, really, but, you know, but of course, you know, if somebody wants to pay for me first class to go there tomorrow, I'll go. Did you get disparaged by hate and jealousy and the negativity that obviously surrounded you when you started, you know, when you became successful? You know, Eat the Rich was was a period of, of being successful. This record, Pistol in My Pocket, was also um, a success. So... What, did you get disparaged by the reaction, by the racism, by the, you know, the the hate 
the pure hate that was coming out. Uh, well, yeah, and I suppose that was due to my oversensitivity. But, but you know, I think what you do with, um, you know, shit is that you turn it into manure, don't you, in the end? So, um, so yeah, so, I mean, the thing is, when you've had so much of it, I mean, it's, it's like anything, you know, you can go two ways, you can go down or you can go up. So I chose to, you know, use it as fertilizer, really you know become more you know it's like that the, the psychopaths um were my best gurus really you know they they their their actions you know become your best defense in the end you know and certainly an opening into the uh the the minds of of certain humans so yeah did you have an affair with Freddie Mercury? Well, it was very, very fleeting, and that's going to be the very fleeting answer. Okay. Um, as I sort of mentioned earlier, that you know, I was I was in London during the eighties, and I found um, the homophobia and all the other things that went with it, sexism, racism, misogyny, um, very uh, a very difficult time. And on top of that uh being part of the gay community um aids and the effects of what happened with aids were so prevalent and that friends would sort of disappear and then you'll find out six months later that they had died you know you'd go to a club and you'd knew certain people to say hello to and then suddenly they weren't there and then a few months later you'd find out um that they died and one club i used to go to in um Oh my God! It's between Manor House and Turnpike Green. Bolts, lasers. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, well, I went there regularly between I think it was eighty two and ninety four. Then in ninety one, I did an interview in the club, and the owner was there, and I asked him why he shut the club, and he said to me, "Everyone died," mm. and it was one of the most shocking moments. Although I'd ex experienced, you know, the death of people around me, it was one of the most shocking moments for me to realize that whole little pockets of a community would die. Um, how, for you, was it to live through that period in the 80s? I mean, Lee died later um, of uh, AIDS-related illness. Um, how was it for you to live through that period and have this going on around you? Well, you know, apart from being, you know, uh, vilified and accused of being a spreader, you know, uh, even though I don't have AIDS, um, you know, just for being camp and, you, you know, a beacon, really. Um, it was a horrible time. I mean, the thing is, it, it was trouble in paradise because, as you say, you know, you turn up to, say, like, gay Monday nights at um, the Hippodrome when Peter Stringfellow had it. Um You'd, you'd find that um, paradise was becoming empty because you'd ask, for example, oh, well, where's um, Ben, Benjamin? I've not seen him for a few weeks. Oh, well, Benjamin died, you know, like this new, you know, this disease, this AIDS, you know. Oh, well, that's, you know, really knocked you back and impacted your evening a bit. And then another three people that you hadn't seen, you know, for a few weeks. Oh, well, they're, they're in hospital because they've got that AIDS, you know, and it was that sort of thing. So, you know, um, it was very, you know, sad, traumatising time. And also, you know, I mean, going on the gay scene as well, that, you know, it wasn't always, you know, it wasn't the place where, you could go a lot of the time and, and feel like embraced and encouraged and loved and supported. It was often the place where you met the most hostility, you know, as well. Um, why? Tell me the, why, in what form? Well, because, you know, I mean, I, I think that, the, that uh, well, I don't think that there was um, an awful lot of self-loathing you know, self-hatred 
you know, and people who hadn't grabbed the bull by the horns and, and done the inner work. So, you know, it's like through their marginalization or and perceived oppression, they were using others as a punch back for their own neurosis, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, drag queens and trans people, um, as they are to a great degree today, uh, being used as a punch bag for other people's neurosis. So, you know, um, I know that things have changed quite a bit, but, I, you know, there's an awful lot of work uh, to be done. But, um, no, um, the 80s were, during the AIDS uh, pandemic or epidemic, um, it was a very bittersweet time. It was a very bittersweet time to be yourself, you know, as somebody who was fighting to be enough after being brought up uh, and told that you're not enough, having this, um, you know, inadequacy instilled in you. And then you go to, uh, oh, well, you know, I found my tribe, the gay, the LGBT tribe. And it's there that you meet a lot of hostility as well. So that that it's it's such a sad scenario, I think, all round. And especially then, you know. But you know, there were some great things. There were like things like the poor chest of alls, you know, where like all the old drag and all the old camp, you know, queens and that used to go and uh, poor chest of all, uh, halls in um Bayswater. They were great things. You know, we had a night of a thousand frocks at the Hippodrome in the 80s, hosted by uh, Bailey and Raquel Welch, you know, came uh, one uh, Monday night. And, you know, or Pete, you know, there was a live zoo on the stage where the lion escaped off the stage. So everybody was screaming. And then the alligator wouldn't perform, you know. And uh, so there was some you know, great things. And I loved, I, you know, there was, they, if you lived a, your life on a piece of black 12 inch vinyl, which as kids used to do in the eighties and as club kids, you know, dressing up, um, you know, you, you'd be invited out seven nights a week to things at sometimes. And you'd always take a, you know, a suitcase and Tupperware so that you could nick some of the, um, you know, the buffet. So you had something in, to eat in the week, you know, it was, it was some fantastic things that happened, but there was a, an underlying, um, you know, sort of hostile culture as well, you know, I mean, I, you know, I don't see life as a competition, you know, and unfortunately, whether you're LGBTQ or cis and hetero, you know, some people think that that's what life's about, and I just don't think it it does you a good service, really. Where are you in your life today? What are the what are the perspectives for you today? Because obviously you've been busy all the way through. You've had a lot a lot of um, theatre work. You've you know been on stage and so on and so forth. And I just wonder whether the same perspectives are there for you today, and what your vision is of your own future. Well, you know, my, my future really is just to stay healthy in this tumultuous, uh, chaotic world, which I, you know, um, I mean, I, I, I try to live with an attitude of positive expectancy. Um, I, who'd, have, who'd have thought, you know, like in the 80s that we actually come to such an unempathetic, paradigm but I'm, I'm seeing that paradigm shift you know and I think that things will get better because you have like whole new generations that are being reminded of what socialism and empathy um is meant to you know how it's meant to be you know and they they're seeing everything being stolen from them you know ripped away from them you know I mean I'm sorry, but I don't think it is entitlement to expect to have a roof over your head from cradle to grave, healthcare from cradle to grave, a safety net 
when required from cradle to grave. I don't see why uh, a greedy 1% that serve mammon, money, and not humanity should have it all. And all I see from the top is lie after lie after lie, self-servative being the operative, you know, and this lot, you know, I mean, this isn't even a government. This is a Nazi regime. You know, it's a smash and grab raid. And when they're telling you that, you see, the thing is, if, if it serves rich people, then that's a good thing. But if it serves poor people, then we can't afford it. It's a lie. You're being to told lies time after time after time in order to affect the frontal cortex um, so that you start accepting the scarcity and the massive lies that they're telling you. Uh, you know, you told a lie and untruth enough and you start believing it, but people aren't having it now. You know, 13 years of this rotten Tory government you know, who promised that they'd fix this, fix that. You remember the three hundred and fifty million pounds on the side of the buses, and if we're, you know, they can't even tell us one good thing that's come out of Brexit. And if this three hundred and fifty million pound uh, a week um, was was to save our NHS, how come that they're decimating our NHS when you've got nurses using food banks? for a start, you know, uh, when you've got uh, thousands, you know, nearly half a million children in this country with no shoes on the feet, no breakfast in the stomach, you know, starving, you know, how, how, how can that, their ideology being a good thing, if you vote Tory, if you vote for this scum at the top, then you vote for your own limitations and your own oppression and the limitations and the oppression of everybody else, you know? And if you, you think the sun shines out of their eyes, then shame on you because you are not awakened. You're not woke. And also you notice that they use woke as a slur in the same way that they subverted the 3,000 year old uh, symbol of good fortune, a uh, Buddhist symbol of good fortune, good luck, empathy, how the Nazis subverted that into something horrific. And that's what they've done with woke. They won't mention what the origins of the word and the, the, the ideology of woke meant. It meant to be a way and to fight against the injustices of all people, not just black people. It started in the 40s in America. It was revived in the, the 60s civil rights uh, uh, fights in America. Woke means empathy, justice for all, not, you know, people like being, uh, you know, just dressing up and calling them, you know, making up myriad genders because they're primal screaming for attention you know oh the left you woke you know so you know people just need to wake up really and stop being bamboozled by uh you know greedy bastards well Lana, it's been wonderful to speak to you i mean you oh. really have had a fascinating <laughs> life and a fascinating journey to this point i look forward to the day that you create music and go back on stage and perform again oh thank you Kiss. really appreciate it and all the best with everything up there is an interview i recommend down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews and here is where you can connect <laughs>